through this presentation in about an hour. I'm going to take the first 15 minutes or so. Um, and then James, uh, who will need to load up your slides, yeah, great, um, will talk about this kind of in detail. He's from Passive House Institute U.S., so that's FIAS when we use that acronym. That's what that means for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, and then Tony's going to show some examples, so we're going to try to cover everything. Um, I'm going to do something that has hardly ever been done, which is a Passive House presentation without numbers. <laughs> so I want to talk about kind of the why the philosophy, the underpinning, um, kind of the big idea. Uh, it's it's just happens that, um, let's see, advance. I don't have the thing plugged in, or I do. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, I'll just do this way. Um, that with, with Passive House, we, uh, it's, it's very technical. So we usually just jump right into these technicalities, and it can be really bewildering. There's a lot of numbers. And it's hard sometimes to understand kind of where they're all coming from and why, why they're there. So um, instead of going there, I want to just kind of talk about uh, philosophy. So um, Passive House is a building energy standard. So fundamentally, it just means that it's a certification that you can get a plaque. Um, and there's a lot of certifications out there. LEED, Living Building Challenge, Energy Star, and they're all good. Um, the reason I'm here talking about Passive House is because, um, do you, do anybody think I need this or is this better for anybody? Okay, thanks. For this, I thought I projected, but I didn't. Um, is that Passive House takes a very focused and measurable approach to the issue of how do we make buildings green, for lack of a better word. Um, and so, uh, it starts with a really kind of fundamental idea, which is that, as we all know, climate change is a scary topic, and it's something we have to act on very quickly. Um, but how do you set a standard? How do you how do you figure out how efficient buildings should be, how little energy they should consume to make that future look plausible? I like to say that sustainability is kind of a buzzword, but I see it as sort of a binary thing. We either survive or we don't. And it's kind of at that point. Sustainability isn't just some boutique thing. It's like you're going to build in a way that the planet can sustain, or you're just going to just consume things until we go you know, running for the hills. So um, in my first pass house training, and basically I should I should add one thing in terms of the standard, the pass house standard is that it's administered by two different bodies, PHI, Passive House Institute in Germany, and FIAS, the Passive House Institute in the U.S., here in, in the States. And all of my experience has really been through FIAS, which um, we'll talk, we can talk about that more granular thing later. But uh, when I took my training back in 2011, uh, this image on the right was a slide that really hit me because um, when you look at the energy picture globally, Right? There are a lot of different fuel sources, you know, gas, oil, coal, nuclear. Um, and if you look at kind of the where, where demand has been going, this is from 1890 and this projected to 2090, it looks like it's going to keep going up. And when you look at the population of developing nations that are now expecting things like electronics and air conditioning that have been living without it, you know that that is, is realistic. So... Um, Renewables right now are a pretty small chunk of this overall energy picture. Um, Germany just got to 40% renewables uh, this year. So, so that solar is actually their, their top producer of electricity over coal. It's pretty amazing. In the States, we're like 12%, 15%, something like that. Um, so it's a really small piece of the energy picture. But so you go, oh my God, how are we going to get there? I mean, like most of this is coal and gas and, you know, petroleum products. So, um, so you go, okay, well, we'll try to put more solar on and we'll try to do more wind power and all that stuff. And yes, that's true. But what, what really just sort of opened my mind is that there's this huge availability in efficiency and just not using as much energy. If you look at my house in Oak Park, built in 1919, I could cut the energy use of that house down by like 80, 90 95, maybe 100 percent. It's an investment. I got to do it, but it's possible. So efficiency has 
that's where the promise lies. And so that's really what Passive House says, okay, we got to figure out how to make efficiency work. Um, and another way of thinking about this is a global fair share. Like, how much energy should everybody get? You, and this is another thing that was introduced, the 2,000 Watt Society. Um, you look at how many watts per capita. How many, how many watts do you have? If you have a little power pack on your back, how many is going to work globally, right? So you, you get 2,000 watts, okay? Running continuously, you can do whatever you want with it. You can power your house, your car, your refrigerator, whatever. So right now, we're, we're you know, here in the States, we're above 12,000. And a lot of that gets consumed in our buildings. So, um, so I was thinking about this, like I was saying, kind of from a more big picture idea, instead of just jumping right into passive houses, like these technical details, and thinking about, okay, this is about buildings, and so what are the really fundamental things about buildings? You have to step back and say, what, you know, what should a good building do? And so I want to answer that in a contemporary way and, and see how passive house kind of feeds into that. So obviously, number one thing building has to do is provide shelter. It has to give us a place to live, work. It has to be durable. It has to be safe. It has to stand up to climate as climate varies. Um, it needs to provide for our health. So no toxins. We shouldn't be building in poisons to our buildings, to our cities, to our air. We need good air quality, good temperature, and humidity. You know, control these things, natural light, views. Um, this is... Uh, really getting more and more important as we spend more and more time indoors. You just look a mere hundred years ago, which is just a blip in our evolutionary history of like a million years of humanoids. Um, we now spend 90% of our time indoors, but according to the EPA, back a hundred years ago, we were farmers, like 80%. So we were outdoors all the time. So now we're indoors. And this is really important when you think about environmental design. Um, Energy use. So this is something I think a, a building needs to be cognizant of these days. You can't just say, it's a good building, oh, but it's a, just a gas guzzler, you know? That's not that's not good enough. We can't do that. So that's where the fair share comes in. All right, and then finally, uh, oops, culture. I debated what to call this. Um, you know, our building shouldn't just be these soulless boxes, you know? I just came back from a, took the kids to Europe for a trip for over the New Year's. Oh my God, I just like, my soul was bursting with all the beauty everywhere. Now, we, we, we thrive on that. We need that. So, um, supporting the values of time and place, providing a nature connection. I think going back to that primordial idea of who we are as a species. All right, so what does Passive House have to do that? What does the Passive House approach require? And this is kind of where we get into the pre-segue to, to what James is going to talk about with specific metrics. Um, the first thing that the bedrock core of passive house is an overall energy limit. The building cannot use more than, and that, that changes by basically locking it. Okay, so that's, that's fundamental. We're going to design buildings that are really energy efficient. But what's really fascinating about passive house, unlike any other, let's say, net zero building, which is a great achievement, by the way. I'm not disparaging that. But Maslow says you also have to have a limit on the mechanical system energy consumption. So, in other words, you can't just design a big leaky bucket and have a giant hose filling it up. You need to design a good sturdy bucket that doesn't need more than just a tiny little bit of water. Um, so, an analogy would be like, okay, a big glass box with hardly any insulation and it leaks like a sieve, but we have, you know, just like 15 acres of solar collectors. So we're fine. We're a zero energy building. It's a really um, back ass words way to do it. So so the passive approach says you're gonna you're gonna conserve energy by design. And the building in its nature, the shape, the orientation, the level of insulation is gonna be conservative. So you're not gonna need a lot of renewables. Um, and I'm kind of Highlighting over here what sort of those fundamentals that play in. Um, another thing that the passive requires is energy modeling. You have to model, create an energy model of your building so you know exactly where all BTUs and kilowatt hours are going and where they're coming from. 
Um, so, like, if this is passive building, we have how many bodies in here, how many lights, these are creating heat, it's winter time, how much is the mechanical system needed need to provide heat so we stay comfortable? You know, you're, it's very granular. This is a really good model. And once you get in the practice of it, it's not that hard. Right, James? You're, you're breathing for you. You live and breathe it. But we've gotten to the point where it's just this wonderful, like, big machine set of dials. We, we understand our building from the standpoint of the ventilation efficiency and the number of occupants and the, the, the efficiency of the lighting and the number of windows and the size of the windows and the performance of those windows and the thickness of the insulation on every surface and how much shading is at those windows. And we can just tweak all those dials until we're like, ah, that's the sweet spot right there. So what if we added two more windows? Okay, well, the cooling demand goes up, but the heating demand went down. You know, so it's really great. You get very aware of what you're doing. So you're not just like designing, ah, it looks great. Let's send it to the engineers and see how it works. You get to do it. You get to understand the implications of your design actions, which is scary for some of us architects. But it's good. Keep you honest. Yeah, I did that again. Um, okay, and the other, the, the next one is air control. This is this is hugely important. That in order to have good air quality in the building, you have to control that air. You have to not let the envelope leak because leaks can cause condensation, which can cause structural problems, mold, um, you know, con contaminants coming into the building. You want that thing to be as airtight as possible. And of course, a lot of people say, oh my God, we shouldn't have built and breathe. You know, isn't the air quality going to be terrible? So, yeah, it would be terrible if you didn't ventilate it. So you have to have a good ventilation system. So um, thermal envelope airtightness plus heat or energy recovery ventilation equals really good air quality. And low energy use and a more durable structure. So shelter, health, energy use, these things are all supported by air control. So it's um, it's a thing that's uh, scary, I think, for a lot of first time builders who haven't done a passive house to hit this very demanding air tightness target. Um, but it's not that hard to do once you just know what to look for, I think. Would you say? I said the first passive house I worked on was Electric. That was my role. Electrician? Sparky? And Don't poke the air barrier. They, they, they said you could have zero penetrations in the building. Yeah. That's yeah. what we had. I put any lighting on this thing, right? And there was 30 lights on the outside. Of the yeah. Yeah. So, right. Um, yeah. You, you have to think about how you're penetrating that, that envelope. Yeah. That's so, how I learned the world of tapes and clocks. Yeah. I did know about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so then finally, Durability. Uh, you, if you're going through certification, which you, you should, um, you have to do thermal bridge analysis and building science analysis of what you're building. So if there are leaks via structure, like you've got a piece of steel cantilevering out through your, through your facade, you're going to have a serious issue with thermal bridging that could create condensation problems, not to mention the energy loss problems. If you have continuous concrete balconies cantilevering out, sucking you know, 25% of your heat out, that's going to be a problem uh, from a from an energy standpoint. And, you know, frankly, as an architect coming up, I never thought about any of this stuff until I took passive house training. What is it going to do to your condensation, your durability, etc.? cetera? So, um, so therm models, you know, those really cool rainbow colored uh, images we passive house consultants love to put up, you know, then, that's where that stuff comes in. Um, but it's really about durability and making sure that this building's going to last and it's not going to get condensation and you know degrade. The thing is that's interesting, our old buildings, like my old house in Oak Park, um, you turn on that you know coal power plant in your basement or natural gas or whatever it is, um, and you're basically just heating up your walls. You're drying your walls out from the inside because there's no insulation back in the day. Um, I mean, I insulation my walls now, but uh, the point is, if you just have this wood frame building, you're just, you're just heating it, and it's never going to get a condensation problem because it's just drying, it's leaking and drying constantly. You get a nice thick wall with some airtight control, um, you have more possibility of having condensation issues. You have to be careful where the air barrier is that's keeping the air, the bulk air going into that wall. It's, it's one of those things that you've you, you got to be more careful. So 
that's one of the great things about the passive approach, just having that check as you're going through certification. Um, and then finally, uh, Passive House makes no demands on style. It doesn't tell you how to design anything. It just says these are the targets you have to hit, and they're very clear cut, they're very measurable. So really, you can meet the standard in a whole bunch of different building shapes, uses, contexts, um, you know, whether it's a school or a high rise or a single family house or whatever. Um, you'll find that certain shapes are going to be easier than others. A single story ranch that's, you know, 2,000 square feet, 10 feet wide is going to have a ton of surface area. So you're going to put crazy amounts of insulation on that to make the standard. Whereas if you brought that into a much more compact shape, it would be a heck of a lot easier. So it will sort of encourage you, nudge you towards a more simple approach to design that looks more like traditional building shapes, which is why did they do that back in the day? Because they didn't have big machines to condition. So so it actually, there's a lot of that kind of inherited wisdom that we're kind of coming back to. Man, those old guys weren't so dumb. So, um, so to summarize, uh, just kind of the, this background, um, I think of Passive House as a design method where you become aware of where all your energy is going. Everything's measurable. And that's really the, the, the thing that's so clear about Passive House compared to other building standards. It's a way of building, and you'll notice that builders who are out there taking it on bring that craftsmanship, that sort of um, finished carpentry level of care to the building envelope and the thermal envelope. And it's really a great thing. It's like, yeah, of course, you shouldn't just like slap that up like you don't care about it and leave gaps and holes everywhere. Every Everything is crafted. Um, it's a certification path, like we said. You can get your plaque. Um, but more than that, you get the best eyes in the business in terms of energy modeling and uh, durability analysis looking over your shoulder saying, you know what, I think you missed something here. Your foundation's got a big thermal ridge, you might want to deal with that. Um, it's also a great companion standard. So there's other things I was talking about before, like LEED, uh, Living Building Challenge. They don't have this kind of focus on like letting you dial in via this model exactly where your envelope and um, your energy use should be. So with that and Living Building, I mean, if I was going to do a Living Building, which I'd love to do. Anybody want to hire me to do them on the you know, there? Um, it's it's a, uh, a standard that requires you to have a net positive building, which means you better make sure that the thermal envelope is efficient. You don't you don't want to try to get the net positive without taking care of the you know insulation levels, etc. So it's a great companion standard to other comprehensive standards. Passive house is energy only. Living building is everything. Lead is everything. Um, and finally, it's an evolving standard. This is what's really exciting to me when I was at the conference in Boston a couple months ago. Uh, Lisa and Graham Wright, uh, Lisa White and Graham Wright, two of the, the, the main brains. Graham is what's called chief scientist for a senior scientist. Senior scientist that he has unveiled the new version of the standard. So the 2015 standard was already kind of an advancement. 2018, it's like a code. It's like a code cycle every three years. So, um, but, but I was really excited because I felt like this is a really smart move in a good direction. And so I got uh, uh, just enthusiastic about it. So that's what I've got. Um, one thing I want to uh, add, I meant to say this at the end. Um, and James, if you want to come up and you can plug in while I give this credit. Um, I was just elected the regional rep to the Passive House Conference in Dallas. So, Thank you for your, your, your votes and your confidence. Um, but that means that I'm talking to the national group. So if anybody wants anything to go up the tree to them, let me know. And then I'm on a monthly call with the national group, and I'll, I'll bring that back to the group. So, um, yeah, so thanks. Okay, James Ortega, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, and then I'll plug you in if you want to. Hi everyone, my name 
is James Ortega. I work on the certification team for Fast Fastness 2 US. Fias is how I primarily refer to it because I'm the biggest mouthful. Um, I am a certified pass house consultant and a recently licensed architect, according to my exams in November. So, um, um, and I'm going to talk to you. This pairs really well. I think of what Tom talked about because he gave a really good, like, without numbers overview of pass house. It's really hard to do, I think. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the numbers, I guess that you can say. So, Tom already pointed to this, what is a passive building? Um, this is Lisa White's slide, who's a certification manager, and she loves to talk about it. And we like to talk about it in terms of like a thermos versus your current house, which is basically a solo cup that's leaking. Um, slowly, all of your energy is going out, and you're filling it back in with your hard earned money um, to, to pay your bills, basically, for your, your heating and your cooling and all that kind of stuff. So, I'm going to talk briefly about these two points here. Um, first one, history lesson, a little bit. Um, so passive house is not new um, by any means. Um, in, in the 70s, during the oil embargo, the US and Canada kind of teamed up a little bit, and a lot of researchers were looking into what was called passive solar at the time, um, which many of you have probably heard of and refer to in your own work and your writings and stuff, because it was kind of a unique style, right? It, this kind of exemplifies it quite well. We're large south-facing windows. Let's capture the sun. Let's put thermal mass, and we're going to never have to get our buildings. Fantastic idea for the winter. We cook everyone in the summer. So that's the that's the offset, right? So um, Passive House basically then kind of, we went through our phases of design and development, working through, um, and it was the Germans and in the early 90s, and then throughout the 90s, basically, were developing and like, um, creating a standard that they could actually measure. Because again, passive solar was, we'll throw a bunch of glass at it, lots of thermal mass, and you know our workers are working in their short sleeves in winter, so we're doing really well. Um, but we didn't have any measurable things to actually work on with, these pro with those early projects. Um, so the Germans, being kind of inspired by a very they got it together and they built an entire energy model in an Excel spreadsheet, um, which is massive and it's called the Passive House Planning Package, still around. Um, many people still use it. Um, and it basically you can calculate an entire building by entering in every single piece of it. And it will tell you what's your overall energy use in terms of heating and cooling, um, and then what's your overall energy use. So that was awesome and it was perfect for the German climate. Um, Katrine, who is Katrine Klingenberg, our executive director at FIAS, um, raised in Germany, loved these principles, these ideas, brought them over to the U.S. Um, her actual first house here in the U.S. in 2002 is this one pictured here. Um, it's called the Smith House uh, in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. Um, and she built it to meet the Germans' criteria for a passive house, which was this 4.75 kbt per square foot of heating demand, um, and 3.14 BTU per square foot for heating load, which are just incredibly low numbers for those two values. Um, and she came up with a couple of things that happened to her along the way. First of all, in Urbana, Illinois, it gets a lot colder than anywhere in Germany, and it also gets a lot hotter, and it has humidity, because that's that's a huge thing in the U.S., and Germany has almost no humidity most of the year. So her beautiful house, which kind of looks very similar to you know these early kind of um, solar houses, overheats quite a bit to this day, like mid-80s, high-80s in the summer with the air conditioning cranked all the way up and all the blinds down because it's got you know TGI's outboard of 2x4s. 
Um, and she was, she decided at that point that there's no way we can, with credibility, make everyone do this because it's crazy in this climate zone. There's something about the USS climate zones that we have to look into further and do some more research because we just can't honestly tell people that this is going to be a comfortable home ever. It just doesn't, it's just not going to work that way. So with that, about in 2012, I'll skip ahead a little bit. So in 2012 is when we started to work on uh, the US's climate specific PS plus 2015 standard. Um, which came out in 2015, which Tom alluded to, and basically the idea there was to check all of the climate zones and do an optimization for heating and cooling for each climate zone and different regions in the U.S. So your your heating demand criteria is not going to be the same in Florida as it is in Illinois, and it's not going to be the same in Illinois as it is in Alaska or Minnesota or something like that. So that's kind of the basic idea for that part. I'm going to skip through these because I think Tom, Tom did a good job already of covering these five basic principles that we live and breathe when we're talking about passive house buildings, but continuous insulation, air tightness, optimized windows. So this is kind of a detraction and a little bit of a throwing shade at the solar passive where it was like maximized windows. We now know that you need to you know, optimize them, put the shades in the correct location so you don't overheat your home. Um, and then balance ventilation, heat recovery, and the final one, I always think of it as like kind of a net effect that you're able to take advantage of with these types of buildings more than it is an actual like, we're gonna start out with a minimized mechanical system. It's like all of these will then add up to, I don't need a gigantic mechanical system anymore, so let's size it down, actually take some precautions and not you know, oversize everything by 50% because it's available and we can. These are basically um, slides with simplified diagrams. With this one's actually got a number here. So this one's this one's showing. This is our requirement for 2015 for air tightness. So we actually put a hard number on how much air leakage can go through a building, um, and it's 0 0.05 CFM 50 per square foot of envelope area, which doesn't mean much to most people. Um, but basically, this is a pressurized air tightness requirement. So they bring in a blower door system. So you don't know what that is, it's basically a giant fan. And you are pressurizing and then depressurizing your building. So you seal up everything, you close all the windows, you put this giant fan in front of your front door, you pressurize the building and you see how much air leaks through it and you can tell by the difference in pressure. So 0 0.05 CFM 50 means that at 50 pascals of pressure through one square foot of envelope area, you're only losing 0 0.05 cubic feet per minute of air, which is ridiculous in this climate. It's, it's very, very low. Um, so you're talking about like a, a single family home, medium sized single family home. If you met this target, you'd be losing somewhere between 70 CFM and 100 CFM per minute of the entire building, not just you know, what you would typically expect. So for reference, it's six times lower than the ICC told you. Optimized windows we talked about. This is one of those beautiful therm files that Tom had mentioned. Um, balanced ventilation with heat recovery. The, the major thing I'll talk about here, which this always reminds me of this, is that um, the idea of this heat recovery and actually having a ventilation system, which most single family homes don't have, they just don't put them in. You're relying on exfiltration and infiltration through the walls, through the cracks to bring in fresh air into your building. First of all, that's pretty gross if you think about it. Like, you've got a bunch of dirty construction materials that are inside your walls that you put in there, covered up with gypsum board and exterior sheathing. And now you're like, yeah, that's where all my fresh air is going to come. Great, fantastic. Which leads to asthma and stuff like that, health problems along those lines. So, the, the balanced ventilation with heat recovery idea is that you're now actually choosing where your fresh air is going to come from, it's going through a filtered system and it's actually recovering some heat in, in the meantime as well. So it's like the best of all three worlds in terms of energy, um, efficiency, and health, basic, basic health. Right, exactly this picture, controlled versus random, and then minimize mechanical systems. We can talk about those more later if you guys are interested in the 
really small ones. I hear that Fujitsu for KBT, we've seen um, we've seen actually some issues with multifamily projects, especially that they just the loads in each room is so small that they don't actually have a ducted or a, a ductless mini split that's small enough to satisfy that load. So they have to go to the next biggest size, which can be sometimes double what is required. And then when you have something that's double the capacity, you'll turn on the system, you'll tell it, okay, I want 68 degrees, and it'll meet that almost instantly because it's such a huge capacity, and then it'll turn itself off. And then it goes up to 69 degrees, and it's like, oh, nope, we need to turn back on. So turn, it's, it's short cycling, and that's just a super inefficient way to run a mechanical system. So this kind of stuff where the manufacturers are finally starting to appreciate and realize that, oh, there's a demand for smaller units, and they're starting to make them, is very encouraging. So I think that's a, a good way that we've started to kind of push forward. So here's what I'll kind of go into kind of the nitty gritty of how FIAS Plus 2015 came out, uh, came about, and how we, how we went through the standard, because it's important for you to have a background of 2015 for you to get any sort of appreciation for what we did for 2018, which is now um, in the full launch phase. So we always kind of look at FIAS Plus in 2015. We're, we're working with the Department of Energy um, and all of these other programs trying to work in, in terms of going to um, ba basically working the stair set to get to net zero is the goal, right? So IACC 2009 was built off of by 2012. Um, Energy Star is kind of built off of those as well, um, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of the Zero Energy Ready Homes program, um, and FIAS has Zero Energy Ready Homes and all of these below it as part of the program as well. So they're built into the certification. Um, if you're going to do a FIAS Plus project, you're also going to have a Zero Energy Ready Home if it's a single family home. Um, I'll leave this up for a sec, but I don't expect you to remember all of this. Um, so the, the certification criteria itself is kind of split into three pieces. So we consider probably the biggest piece that Tom is mostly concerned about, or anybody who's doing a project is concerned about to start with, um, is the space conditioning targets, because those are the things that really define the design of the project. Like the air tightness and the source energy, those are kind of set apart like we didn't do any optimized study for those the air tightness was totally dependent on a good durable wall system that also would reduce energy efficiency and the source energy is based on how many people you have in your project and that's how it's defined so typically the designer is not going to tell the client oh you can only have four people in your house right you do it the other way around so the space conditioning targets are really what will drive the design for the most of the most of the time especially in terms of envelope configuration, number of windows, size of windows, all that kind of stuff. So some terminology to start with. We're going to be talking about annual demands and peak loads. Or I will for the most part, unless somebody else wants to come up and talk to you. Um, and annual demands are, the, are basically, that's the energy use for the entire year. So I have a certain amount of heating and cooling I can use across one year. And that's what the targets are set to. Peak load, that's your worst case scenario. So that's like the worst 24 hours. That's how much energy you can use when it's in Chicago minus 20 degrees or something like that. Um, and so a peak load means it's the worst case condition in either the heating season in January or the cooling season in July or August, whenever that would be. The methodology for 2015 is pretty simple when you think about it, but really kind of a lot of work to get it to do what we wanted it to do. And the basic idea was that Katrine going back to her house was thinking of this in terms of, first of all, this wasn't really cost effective to do what she did back in 2002. It was way too much insulation and it didn't re result in the, the comfort that she was looking for. Right? So she knew there's not going to be any adoption and it's really hard to encourage adoption if something is expensive and doesn't work the way it's supposed to, right? So her, uh, the idea was that her, um, and actually Graham Wright is the one who kind of wrote the protocol and the standard to do the optimization test, but we used 
um, the built, uh, NREL's Building Energy Optimization Tool, which basically is a database of um, cost, cost data for building materials, including labor and the actual materials itself. And it also does energy modeling as well. So it does a, an hourly simulation of a building of whatever configuration you input with parameters in terms of occupancy and stuff like that. So it'll basically spit out to you, okay, I know how much, or it, it, it does a series of hundreds, thousands of repetitions of the same building, and you can give it parameters to play with. So you can tell it, okay, you know the cost of a two by four wall with two inches of polyiso on the outside, and then you also know different configurations where I've got a two by four with four inches, two by four with six inches, but now I switch to a two by eight and I have four inches outside. All these different parameters you can give it options, and it will basically run the simulation over and over again until it finds what we call the optimal path, which is basically the lowest energy use possible um, for the lowest amount of money. And in 2015, we built in some things that were not necessarily parameters that it could play with. So the first one, of course, was we, we put our own requirement for air tightness. We said we want this building to be durable, and we don't want it to be a problem. So we already had a step up from any baseline building that this system would come up with where we told it this air tightness is a requirement of our certification, so it has to at least meet this. So it's always going to be better than the baseline just based on the air tightness. Um, a second factor that we incorporated as well was the comfort factor. And it's, it's not possible to actually tell the, this model that you want to be comfortable everywhere. So we interpreted comfort being related to um, indoor, or interior surface temperature of components. So the interior face of your window, for instance, couldn't get below a certain temperature difference with your indoor airspace. So we actually set a, uh, a limit as well on how poor the windows you could choose. Because good windows now, as well as in 2015, but probably more so in 2015, are very expensive. So in terms of a cost and a monetary optimization, this probably would never have chosen triple pane windows unless we told it that, hey, triple pane windows in Alaska are going to be the only way you can keep occupants comfortable within you know three feet of a window when it's the middle of the night. So that was another kind of factor that's not necessarily a parameter. It's kind of a locked-in thing that would lead to kind of this result. Um, and then as we're going through the study, we were still trying to get to a sweet spot between conservation and generation. So that's like the, the biggest part of this curve here, which is showing cash flow. Um, and on the left, it's showing mortgage and utility. So that's how much cost is going into the building. So it's actually saying, this is how much I'm spending on gas, and this is how much I'm spending on electricity, and this is how much I'm spending on um, you know, actually paying for the project to be built as well. And then at the bottom is showing um, basically the mortgage, right? So on the far right, it's showing mortgage, and that's like, yeah, you can throw money at this until the cows come home, and we can reduce the energy by an incredible amount, but it's not cost effective because that's just, you're never going to make that back in the long term. So FIAS Plus 2015 ran a single home, one. 2,500 square foot single family home in 1,017 climates through this optimization tool. After we did that, we could then make targets in terms of heating and cooling um, to help kind of lead the design um, for all 1,017 of those climate zones or of those different cities and locations in the US. Um, and this shows kind of one run. Where is this located? This is in, I'm not sure where this is located, but you can see all these gray dots are optimization paths that the tool ran. And basically this black line is showing what it found to be the least cost at every step of the way. So all these gray dots is showing where this started. So energy related costs, so it's, it's the higher these get, basically the more cost you're spending in terms of energy. And the source energy savings on this side is showing you where the optimization happened. So this is, we're saying we spent the least amount of money and we didn't use the least amount of energy because that's way over here, but this is, you know, twice as much money up front 
as energy you're going to save. So this optimal path is what was chosen for the study. And from this, we were able to kind of back out and pull out the heating demand and the cooling demand targets and the heating load and all those things that would pull from the model. So this slide is always kind of here because being that Katrina German, and we took basically the same ideology that the Germans used in their climate and just applied it to the U.S. as many climate zones, we always kind of have to refer to must meet all four targets is kind of alluding to the Germans only require you to meet two. You only have to meet either the heating demand or the heating load. Um, and, and we require all four of them because we've actually optimized it for every climate zone, in our opinion, and so far it's worked out. So that's kind of what that big must meet all four is because people always ask. Um, and basically we're showing that here we have many climate zones, which everybody should know being in the US. And this is kind of the epitome, I would say, I guess, of the 2015 standard. So each of these little markers, even if it's the same color, has a different set of targets um, that you would meet for your particular building in that location. So this is just showing the US, but we also have locations here. You can see a couple um, in Canada as well. So we do serve uh, North America, and we actually have a couple projects in Japan. Uh, as well, which is kind of a, a fun up and coming thing we've been working on. The next kind of pillar, so after after we were able to determine the, the heating and cooling targets that we wanted to get, we, we then were looking at how much, what's the limit people can use in your in your building. So this is this is relating back to like the amount of energy requirement total. So in case everyone doesn't know the difference between a, a site energy and a source energy, site energy is, is basically the energy that you use at the project location. So basically this is what you're going to get charged for at your meter. Um, I turn on my one, one watt light bulb or whatever for 10 hours, I get charged 10 watt hours of power. Um, source energy is relating back to where did that power come from to start with? And it's basically trying to account for that our grid is not that clean. Um, we, there are quite a few losses when you think about we started with electricity at a power plant and then they had to wire that all the way to your house. Um, so we are caring about what the source energy is um, and the site energy will be better because of it. So for this low stuff here, so it says there's an example, electricity has a a primary or a source energy factor of 3.16 kilowatt hours per kilowatt hour. And basically that means that when I use one kilowatt hour at my building, um, it actually took 3.16 at the power plant to get that to me. And we have, as, as Tom had mentioned, we have, um, we serve both residential and, and non-residential projects alike. Um, but the source energy target differs slightly because commercial buildings, it's much harder to put a number on how many actual occupants are in the building at any one time and how we would allow for some kind of a, an energy requirement for them. So for 2015, um, residential projects are allowed uh, 6,200 kilowatt hours per person per year. And I love that this says still temporary here, but it says temporary increase from the goal of 4,200 kilowatt hours per person. And basically, the, the 4,200 kilowatt hours per person was our attempt to have an equal share of carbon for everyone in the world. So if everyone in the world used 4,200 and then was able to lower it every year after we launched 2015, we would you know, be able to keep the environment under 2 degrees Celsius. That was the idea. Uh, when we started to try and actually model this on projects, the 3.16 primary energy factor is huge. That's like so much bigger than most other locations, um, and that's and that's a factor for the U.S. on average. So some places in the U.S. are like seven, some places are one. Like it totally depends on what your local network can do. And because we're serving the whole U.S., we decided to use national average. Um, but the 3.16 and the and the grid, basically how, grid, how dirty the grid was, played a factor into it would have been almost impossible to meet 4,200 without immediately putting PV on any project. 
So we, we upped it to 6,200, knowing that eventually the grid will get cleaner and hopefully these projects and other net zero projects like it will help to lead the grid to actually get less dirty. Um, so that's kind of the explanation for that little caveat note there. Um, and then we always have uh, an allowance for process loads. Otherwise, something like, um, say you've got a building totally dedicated to something like refrigeration, there's no way in hell you would ever get a building totally dedicated to refrigeration to meet that low of an energy use per square foot limit. Um, and basically, if, if that's the goal of the building and it's just that's the machinery, there's no way that machinery can get any more efficient. We have to give some kind of allowance because otherwise they would never even go for any kind of energy efficient metrics at all. They wouldn't improve their lighting because they know, hey, 90% of my energy use is just these refrigerators, right? Like, why would I try and take care of anything else? So that's what the, the process load allowance is there for. Not many people actually have taken advantage of that yet because we've mostly seen office buildings where the process loads are the people's computers and you can get more efficient computers and you can you know, time your lighting better and things like that. Air tightness we kind of talked about, so it's a combination of building durability and energy savings. And then here's some look at some, some looks at some numbers to go along with what I've said so far. So we've got kind of a wide range for heating demand and load in the US um, from one, which happens in Florida and most of the southern states. Um, and then this target of 16.8 happens in Alaska. So we have a pretty wide range that people can actually target and get to. Um, cooling. I always think it's cool that that's even bigger because it's a huge amount of energy to cool a space, especially in a hot and humid climate. Um, so that range is 1 to 23. Um, and we have a couple different things here. So there's um, envelope air tightness. We actually have two values here. Um, the 0.05 is for single family and then anything under five stories. And then we have this 0.08. And there's little two stars there, which mean that buildings five stories and up um, that are made of non-combustible construction, which basically means, you know, it's not wood. Um, they don't have the same kind of durability concerns that we would have in a project that's wood stem framed. So if you've got an all concrete building or it's a steel building with exterior insulation, there's not the same kind of concern for, hey, there's going to be structural damage if the interior steel frame gets a little wet. It won't. So that's kind of the small difference in the air tightness criteria. So 2015 was pretty successful, I would say. Um, it, it got a lot of projects to be able to actually go for a standard that if CAT had tried to do the, the German standard everywhere, it would have been really difficult and really costly. Um, and I think Tony might bring up some graphs, right? OK, because uh, I didn't. So 2015, I, I started working for FIAS about two months before the 2015 standard was launched. So I got to do a lot of the back-end energy modeling of the 1017 buildings that we modeled. Um, and at the time, I was like, this is so much work. And I had no idea what we were going to do to ourselves in 2018 at the time. So how low can you go with passive measures, I think, is a good intro to this, because we've, we've taken the same ideology that we did with that single-family home that we ran these thousand climate zones and we decided that after seeing projects that were starting to meet these criteria and being modeled and designed to meet these targets that this maybe wasn't going to work for all building types right because we just modeled a single family home just like kind of like the germans had just modeled in germany and we were thinking this is going to be fine for everybody projects that were denser or projects that were really big we're like, hey, we can never meet the cooling demand even if I turn off all the windows. I close all the windows and I just say, this is just an empty box that doesn't get any solar gains. Their internal gains were too high because their density was too high. They got lights on in corridors all the time. And we're like, okay, we maybe need to take a look at more building types than just one. So we have the same pillars, same, the same ideology all applies. Um, and we did the same study, basically. Um, but now we used five building types, and we did three occupancy types for each building. 
So we did a low occupancy or less dense project, with medium occupancy, and then a high density. And we did all 15 of these in the 2017 plans. So the first one is a single family home that's about 1,100 square feet gross square footage. Um, and that was modeled as uh, the low occupancy was like two people living in the house. Um, the medium occupancy was four. And then the high occupancy actually split that thing into a duplex and said you've got two 500 square foot units on top of each other, and each of them has two people. Um, similar with this slightly larger single family home that's like 2,800 square feet. Um, and then we did a low rise building at four stories, same thing. Um, this one was kind of cool, and uh, we actually did, we had a pilot phase, which meant that we, we tried this in just 17 climate zones to start with, before we did the thousand runs for all of them, because we wanted to make sure this wasn't a total waste of time. Uh, and we originally had a six-story building, instead of this townhouse looking thing here. Um, but when we ran it, the six-story building was literally right in between the 10-story and the four-story in terms of all its targets. So we're like, okay, we can extrapolate that. That's not going to be a problem. Um, but we, we hadn't met one of the other types of buildings we'd seen, which was a townhouse, which is much longer and can have really varied densities, especially depending on how many actual units there are. Um, and then the last one was the, the big boy, which is a 10-story building, um, which had pretty significant um, internal gains, especially from interior corridors and stuff like that. So Tom, I hope you don't mind, but because your project and this project on the right both got pre-certified today, I had the models up. So yeah, Tom, Tom's project on the left here just got pre-certified today. Um, and this one did as well. This is called 425 Grand Concourse. It's in New York City. Um, that one is 26, I believe. And so it's got 22 of residential, um, two stories in between, which aren't shown in this model because they modeled it separately. It was a school. And then the bottom two floors are, I think, like a community center. There's a dentist in there, something like that, too. Um, but basically, our idea, or our goal for FIAS Plus 2018 was to like be able to model these two buildings, which previously would have had to meet the same heating and cooling targets, um, now make explicit targets for both of them. So these are now instead what they model with, and, and it came down to, to basically three major factors that would most influence the, the targets for this design, other than the climate zone. So biggest part was occupant density, so how much square footage per person was there, and then instead of like it being directly related to square footage, it was actually related to the ratio of surface area of the building to square footage. That was like the biggest factor. So for instance, Tom's project was like 2.7 was the envelope to, I see, to the square footage ratio, and it was about 580 square feet per person. So pretty typical, pretty normal project. And you can see here, maybe you can't read it, but it says uh, heating and annual heating demand is up at 8.4, cooling demand is 5.3. So basically what that tells me without knowing too much about this project is that this is in a heating dominated climate because roughly the heating demand is almost double the cooling demand, which would make sense for a small single family home. The heating load is 6.5 and the cooling load is 3.4. So same situation where we know it gets really cold um, here in Chicago. And then I did the New York project. I moved it to Chicago, so that would not be a factor. And here it's got an envelope to square, uh, to square footage ratio of 0.56. <laughs> so this is literally a factor of five off from, from Tom's project. And instead of having 580 square feet per person, this one is at 333 square feet per person. So it's super dense. Um, and here in Chicago, it's, which we would typically think of as a you know, heating dominated climate, especially when you're thinking about a single family home. Um, the annual heating demand is instead of 8.4, it's 4.6. Uh, the cooling demand is the same, so they're both 5.3. But now, which would make you question a little bit, but the major thing to factor here is that now it's actually a cooling dominated building because it's so dense. And the, and the ratio is much better for it. Heating load and cooling load are 
Not quite the same story, but the peak heating load is 4.6 and the cooling load is 2.7. And the reason that these might not align the same way is that even though on an annual basis you might need to cool this building more, the internal gains when you're talking about the loads don't really factor in. We're kind of thinking about this as a worst case scenario in the heating season where we don't have any people, all the stuff is turned off, really minimal internal gains, maybe just refrigerators on or something like that. So the peak heating load didn't change too much, and the, and the cooling load as well is, is fairly low, but I think we factor that in as well. But the basic idea is that in 2015, these two buildings would have had to try and meet that same heating demand, whatever it would have been for 2015, which do you know on the top of your head? I want to say it was like upper fives. Upper fives, yeah. yeah. So they both would have been forced to meet a five for the heating demand, where maybe this one would have met it, but I think the cooling demand was a bit lower, right? Yeah. So the way we're looking at it now, I think, is is much smarter in terms of the, the diversity in the projects that we're seeing. So I'm excited, and I think it's it's going okay so far. Um, this next one is uh, another change from 2015. So. You saw that 6200 number with the 4200 number is the we wished it would have been. Um, we have now gone to, well, the 4200 wished we would have been is now we wish it would be. And uh, it's we've lowered that limit now. So it's been three years since we would have set 42. So if we kept 42 and we tried to keep going that path, we're now putting it at 3840. So that's the actual limit, that's the target. Um, and Probably the biggest difference between, and you can see the, the non-residential went down a little bit as well, but the biggest differences now are that our grid got a lot better. So we were at 3.16, and now we're at 2.8 as a national average. So good job, everybody. We incorporated more solar, stuff like that. The grid has gotten better. Um, and now, I probably didn't mention this before because it's kind of a complicated thing that we did, but. We used to not allow people to use all of the PV that they put on their building. We only, because not everybody was putting battery storage, and if you know anything about PV, you can only use the energy that it's producing when it's produced, unless you have a separate system that's like storing that energy for you. So we actually only allowed, it depended on how much PV you put and how big the project was, but roughly about 35 to 40% of the PV you put on your roof is what we thought and what we modeled that you could use at the same time that it was being produced. You, you said you were talking about modeling. What you modeling. Could use to offset your exactly, exactly. So modeling for the target. You can use all of it yeah. all, all the time. It's fantastic. It works great. And you can offset your bills and stuff with you know, sharing and stuff like that. But for, for our purposes for the modeling, trying to hit that 62, we only let you use 35, 35%, 40%. Now we are letting you use all of it to help you meet the much lower 3840. So you're getting a boost of 50% at least of your, your PV that you're using. And we're also now allowing you to use offsite renewables, um, community renewable energy, uh, RECs, or they're called renewable energy credits, um, and then virtual power purchase agreements. So you have many more options that you can try and use to leverage your financing and get your projects to meet this kind of low level. And of course, the goal is to get to net zero. And as this kind of slide briefly said, we're trying to get to zero by 2050 at the latest. So if we can get there sooner, woohoo. I'm going to talk about this super briefly. And if anybody has more questions about it or you want to like talk about it quickly now, we can. Otherwise, we can save it. We can save it for you. Sounds good. So. Our basic process is that we design first and then we build it after. That's the goal, mostly, right? We don't like to see projects fully built come in and be like, hey, can you certify this? That's really hard to do. So we have a back and forth feedback process, basically, where a consultant or an architect or a CPHC is what we normally call them. Um, they reach out to us. They've got a project that's interested in certification. They're starting to design, um, and they start making this energy model, which I've kind of referred to a couple times and basically me as a certification staff will work with that client, that consultant, that architect, um, and hone in their model. 
So I will go through the drawings and I'll go through the energy model and I'll provide pages of feedback to let you know which stuff matches, which stuff, or hey, to be and the client is satisfied because we both agree. Um, after that, you get this fantastic pre certification email from Lisa White, um, which is very exciting for us because I know I don't have to look at this project again until it's built. That's going to be beautiful. And then step two is where the beautiful builders come out, do all their good work, and they work with the raiders and the verifiers who are third party, which I'm going to take a minute, I'm sorry, because I know we're short on time, but Raiders and Verifiers were something that did not have to exist in Germany, because when you're in Germany and you tell a builder to build something, he builds it that way, and that's how it goes. That doesn't happen super often in the U.S., so Katrine, when she was working on her first project, was working with her first builder, and she said, okay, we're going to put TJIs on board of this 2x4, and he said, no, we're not. And she said, OK, I need a new contractor. So the idea behind this third-party reader verifier system, which is employed by a lot of other programs as well, is basically quality assurance on site that what's happened in the drawings is actually happening in the field. Um, and the FIAS raters and verifiers do a fantastic job of documenting and making sure that all of the stuff that happens in the field is then reflected later for us in the energy model. Because all of this comes back to the certification where you're trying to get this energy model to meet these numbers. And if something happens where, oh, they completely forgot to install all the insulation under this lab, we would like to know because the energy model is going to reflect some very different values if you model them with or without insulation. So those are the basic two step processes. Once the building's complete, the reader or the verifier comes out, does all their final checks, and submits it to FIAS who then has our quality assurance manager look through their documentation, make sure everything's in order. That's when the project gets certified. So that's when you can go out and get your plaque and put it, slap it on your building and take some awesome photos. And that's all I have. I think. Thank you. Excited. Woo! <laughs> all right. Uh, the first time I had uh, attended a past seminar such as this, I was very excited. I, I was very intrigued by this concept that, uh, you know, different approach to the envelope, a different approach to conservation, a different approach to energy use. Um, and so I wanted to know more about it as much as I could learn. But coming out of that first, yeah, uh, coming out of that, uh, that presentation, I was also, uh, everything felt very ambiguous because it was so different. Like, what does a wall section look like? How does it work? How does, uh, okay, so you say I have to meet this hair tightness thing. What does that actually mean? Do I have to get this fancy hair barrier thing and how does it go up? All those things. Um, and so I'm going to tell you uh, the secret here is I'm not going to be able to explain all that to you today. So the best advice I can say is, Tomorrow, start your first passive house, right? We can all do that. Uh, that's absolutely the best way to learn. But um, what I hope to do here is kind of knock off a couple things and kind of tease you a little bit with some of the concepts. So, um, so one of the topics that, or one of the items that we Um, so your energy load profile, this is something that's very important to us in understanding uh, the characteristics or the individuality of every single building. And so if you're new to this topic, these things are all the items that will use energy in your building um, from space heating to lighting. Uh, and this one happens to demonstrate the difference between the current energy code and FIAS 20. So you can see very clearly, uh, most residential projects have a significant, um, a significant portion of their energy use is due to space heating and cooling. And that is exactly, that is precisely what uh, Passive House is excellent at reducing, heating and cooling, uh, energy associated with heating and cooling. 
Um, so if it's, it's absolutely uh, fit very well for residential and living room plots. But to kind of abstract that a little bit, um, so passive house is a little bit of a misnomer as that uh, James mentioned a lot that originally came from Germany with try to uh, say it because I sound stupid, but uh, passive house in Germany, house actually means building. It's more, it's not specific to a uh, person's residence. And so it, it really has in Germany gone beyond uh, just residential. And so to kind of think about that a little differently, in the commercial sector, which is uh, where I do most of my work, uh, we talk about envelope uh, loaded buildings, internally loaded buildings, um, and ventilation dominant buildings. And so based on those profiles, uh, we'll sort of address where we need to focus our energy efficiency. Um, and this is all to say that most of the projects in the U.S. started out as single family homes because of that uh, envelope driven uh, load paradigm for buildings. However, when you move to multifamily, you find out that they have quite a bit more internal load, as James was saying. And so this whole idea of spend your money to spend your money on your envelope to keep the conditions right for the people inside the building, um, there's actually a sweet spot in multifamily. And you don't need as much envelope to get to the same point, which is uh, kind of what some of James' slides were pointing to as well. Um, beyond that, a lot of commercial buildings are driven by ventilation as well, which passive house projects uh, have ventilation ERBs, which recover the energy from the ventilation system. That is basic, that is for commercial buildings, it's a requirement today. Um, so it's not anything new for commercial buildings, uh, but passive house kind of ups the, ups the efficiency and ups the importance of that ventilation system. Uh, and so we're seeing uh, many, many more multifamily projects and single family projects uh, in the United States with, with uh, PS2015 and PS2018. Uh, and we hope to see more schools, uh, offices, municipal buildings, um, seeing people be creative about how to apply the standard across the board. In terms of design, uh, Tom touched on this a little bit. Uh, absolute freedom in terms of uh, design approach. Uh, so here you see, you do see a really tall, skinny uh, six flat. The, you know, I will say that this one's in California, so their um, their climate's a little bit more forgiving than ours. Uh, but it had a modern aesthetic to it. This one's a little bit more traditional with the overhangs and detailing. Um, a lot of projects are. Many of the early adopters were affordable housing clients, uh, affordable housing developers, because they hold on to the buildings for a lot longer. And so that uh, reduction in lifetime energy use uh, really means something to them, and not just open the buildings. And so it was a, a, a great fit for uh, affordable housing projects. However, uh, market rate developers are finding a good fit now as well. I'll also say, from Tim McDonald is, you know, your first one's going to cost you a lot, so get it out of the way. Um, and I think, I think that sort of, uh, that has also helped kind of break into the, the market rate as well. So people have uh, innovated in the affordable housing market and then are now applying those innovations to the market rate. Uh, it's also, it also works for retrofits and renovations. I will say don't make your first passive house project a renovation unless you are uh, really like painful projects. They're much more difficult. Um, so, but it does apply and there are projects, renovation projects that have achieved certification such as uh, this uh, affordable housing project in Pennsylvania. Uh, we finally have our first uh, passive house project in Chicago. Um, Tom's done a, uh, several 
passive house single family projects uh, in the periphery of Chicago, but this will be the first one uh, within the limits of the city of Chicago. We're very excited about this. Um, Landon Bone Baker uh, worked with uh, Lucha, is the housing developer, to do this one. Um, certification is imminent, um, hopefully, very soon. Um, and we got to take a tour of this last year. So uh, we're hoping that this also kind of sparks. Um, sparks a bit more interest in it as well. People can see it, understand what it is, uh, see it firsthand, really experience it. Uh, we, we really think it's going to take off. And then, yeah, thank you. So um, so going back to the PHI uh, FIA standard, so there is, uh, is that a renovation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so there is a, a passive house certified in um, South Side of Chicago. For those that didn't hear, this is the first multifamily passive house project. Um, so that's kind of the loan profile of Tierra Linda. Um, in terms of, um, I wasn't, I didn't work on the project, but uh, I'm familiar enough. I will kind of share. Uh, they did have kind of some learning curves, not only for the project team, but also for the city of Chicago. Uh, they did. Uh, Chicago has a fairly aggressive building code in terms of uh, fire require, fire code requirements. Um, it basically is severely limits you in terms of the use of, of wood in terms of uh, combustible construction. Uh, and so they had to use metal studs. Metal studs can cut heat quite a bit more. Uh, and so they had to, that's a, a reality of, of building in Chicago uh, that they had to overcome. And so, so they did so. They ended up using uh, an exterior insulation finish system, or EATS, drive it. You've probably heard of these things. Um, and in order to get that continuous exterior insulation to protect the steel studs enough uh, to get the art values that they wanted. Um, as I mentioned, it also does apply to offices. This is a project for uh, Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. Uh, they are. They're an organization that uh, their mission is to focus on energy efficiency. Um, and so this was their, their new headquarters um, built a couple years ago, certified to, to Passive House. Um, they wanted to build a net zero facility, and they chose uh, Passive House, FIA's Passive House, in part because of the, the rigor uh, that James talked about to get the So you can see an extremely low uh, DUI and, uh, and just a, a, an amazing project as well. Uh, just to kind of keep that going, a, a beautiful church. Uh, and so it does not does not have to be a single family home. Uh, whatever project types you're working on, uh, you know, consider that they could be, uh, they could meet passive house So one of the things that um, ultimately Passive House is about is about finding that balance between uh, the transmission, the, the loads, the transmission loads and ventilation loads with, with internal loads and solar radiation. And our goal with Passive House is to minimize the, the losses so that way we have, can minimize, also minimize the amount of mechanical heat. Um, and so I think the often in, in the construction world, as it is right now, we don't really think about it as a balance. We just think about it as, here's the design, and now I need a mechanical system to overcome the design. And Passive House really pushes you more towards first figure out what that balance point is in terms of uh, transmission losses or losses and loads uh, versus what you can make up in internal loads and solar radiation. And our tool to do this um, is Woofy Passive. So uh, James and, and Tom talked a little bit about 
the evolution of the fiat standard. Uh, Wolfie is innovating is is innovating right along with fiat, and so this is a tool that's um, ideally suited for understanding the energy use of a passive cost project. Um, and the latest evolution takes advantage of the 2018 adaptions as well. Um, so it takes into <laughs> account um, uh, right now you can you can model in solar shading and it will dynamically uh, account for that within your energy report. So uh, it's exciting that the tools that you use are getting uh, improved right along with the system. And as Todd mentioned, sometimes it feels like you're sitting at the, on, on the flight deck here and you've got all these levers to pull, all these dials to, to adjust. And, and the coolest thing about it is as you're going, you know, these are the results that you're getting that help inform the decisions that you're making. And so you can see this balance here. You can see, oh, my internal gains are great, um, so that's really helping me offset my walls. Well, I'm not quite getting to certification, so what am I going to do? Am I going to put a bunch more insulation on my roof? No, the roof's already doing great. I'm going to add it to the walls. And so this is the kind of re real-time data that you get from using the, the Whoopi tool. Um, and there's all kinds of other uh, charts and uh, data that Um, it wouldn't be a pass house presentation without talking about the perfect wall. Uh, if this is something new to you, look into it. Uh, in short, uh, this is something developed by Building Science Corp. Um, and the idea is um, oftentimes people try to be really inventive with their exterior wall systems and put the structure on the outside or move the barriers around. Um, that's asking for trouble. And so fail safe here is to kind of fall back on um, what's tried and true, which is put your cladding layers on the outside to allow you to drain the bulk water, put your control layers, which are thermal, air, uh, vapor control layers, to the interior of the walls where they're protected and they can't be destroyed or disrupted, and then keep your structure on the inside of the building. This works for the roof, the wall, and the floor. You just tip it on the side. Um, works in non-passive house projects too. Uh, people do get fairly inventive with their walls. Uh, these are just a sampling of, of kind of different approaches. Uh, anybody want to throw out something consistent that they see in all these? There's a whole bunch of different consistencies. But... Yeah, they're big and fat. They're big fat walls. That's also another good one. Lots of great stuff. Uh, Mark is pointing out the air control layer. Uh, and you know, as an exercise, uh, when you're detailing these projects, the idea is always you put your pen down and you have to trace it all the way around the wall section without lifting your pen. If you lift it, you've got a leak in your in your project, in your, in your building, and that's a problem for, for meeting the airtightness requirements. Um, so this one seems to be fairly typical for what we're doing in our neck of the woods, which is um, rigid insulation on the outside, uh, continuous and uninterrupted. You're not seeing any zegrits. If you're still doing zegrits, stop it. They're interrupting. They're making your insulation ineffective. Um, and then supplementing that with some cavity insulation. In our climate zone, climate zone five, we need to get 30% of our R value continuous on the outside to avoid uh, some of those durability issues. Uh, this one is a TJI project in which uh, James mentioned earlier. So they're hanging TGI's um, floor joists vertical on the exterior of the wall. Um, that provides a very deep section for getting some cheap insulation. So you're paying a lot for the TJI, but you're getting super cheap insulation out of here. Uh, note, that we're wrapping the foundations um, and protecting them from becoming a thermal bridge. If you don't do that, that spot's cold and you're condensing uh, water and causing all kinds of problems. Um, different way that they wrap it there. Right, I do want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to try to speed through here. Uh, just kind of 
more on the same project that I worked on. Uh, we use mineral wool, which is inherently fireproof. Um, I think this has real application in Chicago to address some of the, the fire code issues that they have uh, with our framed buildings. Uh, but again, continuous insulation uninterrupted, supplemented with cavity insulation. Uh, here, I didn't wrap the entire footing, and I took a little bit of a penalty for that. This is a thermal bridge, uh, but it was um, properly detailed in a way that um, I'm not going to get so cold here that I'm going to um, condense water or have issues like that. And uh, the builder I was working with, uh, he, he would not have quite got with me on that one. So a little bit of a compromise. Again, inherent flexibility in the system. You can make these decisions. You can make these choices to uh, um, steer the project where you need it to. So fat walls, what does that do for you? Architecturally, it allows you to play with them. It gives you something else to articulate. It gives you something to tip, to bend, uh, something even just as subtle as uh, deeper shadow lines. Um, so I think these are really beautiful um, devices that can be used with creative architects. And so it's not something that has to be a stale box. It's not something that has to be devoid of, of character. So um, lots of talented architects are doing very amazing things with this. Uh, these are James's slides, so thank you, James. Um, Castle House is on a growth pattern. Um, it's exponential, and we're very excited to be a part of this piece of it. To me, this says we need all of you to become professionals uh, and knowledgeable about this as well, because those of us that have experience doing it, we're not going to be able to come up, keep up with this demand, um, and, and we're excited for it because we think that, that is that's absolutely part of where we need to head as a building industry, but also as a society. Is this U.S. Uh, James? This is U.S. There we go. International as well. There are a number of Canadian projects and a few. Yeah, it's probably like 20, 25 Canadian projects, three in Japan, and then everything else in the U.S. So across the board, looks like a <coughs> fairly good distribution, um, which is uh, which is a good sign. Um, but I have to come down on Chicago a little bit. We need to work a little bit harder. There's lots of space to, to fill in the dots. Um, these are Tom's projects, um, and these are two affordable multifamily larger scale projects that are uh, out in the burbs under development. Uh, this is a community center uh, that Lindsay's uh, a part of as well. Uh, the Ellis House is not shown on this one. 